Sometimes we can learn great lessons from small things. That's what we're doing this morning. We're learning some big lessons from some small things. Take, for instance, the short New Testament letter of Philemon. It was written by the Apostle Paul to a man named Philemon. It's a personal letter. And it consists of only 25 short verses. Philemon was a Christian and a worker in the church at Colossae. This letter concerns a slave named Onesimus who had escaped from Philemon and ended up in Rome. Well, while he was in Rome, he met Paul the Apostle and was converted to Christ by Paul. So Paul writes this short letter to Philemon in hopes he would forgive Onesimus for running away and receive Onesimus back as a brother in Christ. But as you look at these 25 verses, there's many, many, many lessons that we can mine from it that I think is very important. I hope you have your Bibles and I hope you can turn them to Philemon. The first three verses teaches us a lesson. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved friend, fellow laborer, to the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember, Paul is probably in a prison in Rome where he's writing this letter from, and Timothy is there with him. And when he's writing to Philemon, notice he says, Timothy, our brother. Our brother. See, Paul at the very beginning stresses that togetherness that should exist between all brothers and sisters in Christ. I think that's important. Aphia, some people believe, was Philemon's wife. Archippus, it says, as our fellow soldier, so probably a preacher somewhere there in the city. One thing we learn at the very beginning is there's no room for non-workers in the kingdom. There's no room for that. Everybody has something to do in the kingdom. There's work to be done in the vineyard. and Everybody can be involved. And so this is one way that they were being involved was because, <clears throat> he says, the church was in your house. So the church there was meeting in their house. And that was one way they were working in the kingdom. Was they were using their house for the church to meet. Our homes can be used for God's glory. So we may not be able to do anything else in the kingdom, but we can open up our house for good. We can have Christians and non-Christians over for Bible studies. We can have them over just to just to pray. We can have fellowship together. And again, this can be Christians, this can be non-Christians. You know, the Bible emphasizes over and over again how important it is for us to be hospitable. Hospitable. 1 Peter 4.9, listen to what Peter says. Peter the Apostle says in verse 9, Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Without grumbling. So there's a way to be hospitable, and there's a way to not be hospitable. He says, do it sincerely. Do it because you want to. Do it because it's good. That's a way you can be a worker in the kingdom. So here at the very beginning of the letter, Paul emphasizes that we can use our homes for God's glory because those people were doing that. The church was meeting in their house. And of course this past year, there's been a lot of that happening. People meeting in their homes. And that's where they were observing worship. So, Use our homes for God's glory. You know, we have, in America, we have some of the finest homes in the world. Compared to how many, many people live, we live in the lap of luxury. I get a newsletter from 
a missionary among churches of Christ that spends a lot of his time in India, and he sends pictures of what some of those Christians live in. And our dogs and cats live better. They really do. They live better than those people do. It's amazing. So, we can use our homes for good. Well then, he continues, Paul does, in verse 4 through 6. I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your faith, your love, and your faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Pray for one another. Paul was a big prayer warrior. Paul knew how powerful prayer was. He was constantly going to God on behalf of other people. That was something he did on a regular basis. He regularly mentioned men and women in prayer, specifically. Not just praying for the church, but just praying specifically for individuals. Back when he wrote to the church at Ephesus, Paul wrote this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. It's a good verse to keep in mind when we're thinking about prayer. He says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Making mention. Usually at the end of the letters that he wrote, whether it was writing to the church at Ephesus or Philippi or Colossae or wherever, or the churches of Galatia, he would mention specific people. And he does in the letter to Philemon at the end. He's always praying for specific people. And while it's good to pray for the church in general, we need to pray for specific people with names, men and women. So this was Paul's common practice. It wasn't just something he did for Philemon or just for Onesimus. He did it for all people. And I wrote in my notes, how often do we really, really do this? How often do we really pray for people regularly? And when we, we say, well, you know, prayer is the least I can do for someone. No, that's the most you can do for someone. Is pray for them. The very most. Well, Paul had heard of their love, or his love, and his faith, the faith of Philemon. You know, it's not wrong to talk about the faithfulness or unfaithfulness of brethren. Paul did that all the time. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 11, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contingents among you. See, it was, it was good for Paul to hear about how things were going in Corinth. And it's good for us, too. It's good for us. We need to know these things. And so Paul would often... In his letters, he would talk about the faithfulness, sometimes the unfaithfulness, of Christians in certain places. Well, what he had heard about Philemon was his love and his faith. Philemon was very concerned about other people. Physical, spiritual well-being. Remember what John wrote in 1 John 3 about... <clears throat> Don't just say you love the brethren. Don't just say it in words. It's about action. It's about works. It's about doing things for other people. Don't just say, yes, I love the church or I love the brethren. I love the brotherhood. Show it in what you do. How can you say you love your brother when you see him? desperate circumstances and don't do anything about it if you can. Philemon was a doer. He was a doer. Paul was moved to thank God for Philemon. I think it's something we need to do every day. 
even if it's just one person that we pick out. And I think the better we know Christ, the better we experience His blessings, the more we will want to share. The more we'll want to share those blessings with other people. Verse 7. For we have great joy, this is number 3, and consolation in your love, because, and here's why, the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brethren. See, by Lehman's efforts in the kingdom, his, his work, his service in the kingdom, had been noticed by other people. The saints, Paul said, had been refreshed by his teaching, his service, his work. They had regained strength. Maybe some of them had gotten kind of weak and tired, but when they saw Philemon working, and working tirelessly, and serving others, and doing good, then that motivated them, and that happens for us today, too. When we see other Christians working and serving, and helping other people, it refreshes us. It motivates us. It gets us moving to do what's right. And that's what Philemon had done. See, other people had seen Philemon working and doing these things, and so they were refreshed by that. They were refreshed by it. They were encouraged by it. And so should we. The fourth lesson, and it's a powerful one, beginning in verse 8. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have gotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. What's the lesson here? And it is powerful. People can change. And if we don't remember anything else from this lesson to, to Philemon, people can change. Now Paul could have ordered Philemon to accept Onesimus back, but what does Paul do? See, Paul doesn't, doesn't order him. Paul's an apostle. He could have ordered Philemon to do it. But no, what does he do? He chooses instead to encourage him, to exhort him to do so. You know, he calls himself the agent. Paul was most likely in his 60s when he writes to Philemon. What happens? Well, first of all, he says, Onesimus is my son, my child. Onesimus had obeyed the gospel. He was now a brother in Christ. He had been begotten. Back in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul used this term, in describing some other folks, in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15, Paul writes to the church there and says this, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. That's what had happened to Onesimus. Somewhere in Rome, it ran into Paul. And Paul had begotten him through the gospel. So now Onesimus was a brother in Christ. He was a runaway slave, but he was a brother in Christ. But here's the part in verse 11. He says, Onesimus was once unprofitable to you. Well, that word unprofitable in our language doesn't have the severity that does in Greek. Because unprofitable in the original language, means useless. He was a do-nothing person. So Onesimus was a bad guy. When he was a slave with Philemon, Onesimus was pretty well worthless. He was a worthless human being. And so he ran away from Philemon, ended up in Rome, but now, Paul says, he is profitable. Just the opposite. Now he's useful now he's a good worker. So this was a radical transformation on the part of Onesimus. This was a major change. 
We read about other people in the New Testament that underwent radical changes too. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6. We'll read about some folks that did that very thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 <clears throat> and verse 9 and following. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. There were people in the church at Corinth that had been homosexuals. They weren't anymore. They had undergone a radical transformation. There were some who were idolaters. They worshipped other gods. They had stopped. Now they only worship Jehovah. There were some who were extorting money from other people. They had stopped. There were drunkards. They had stopped. So these people had went through radical transformations when they were converted to Christ. That's what had happened to Onesimus. A major change. People can change, and they do. More lessons, beginning in verse 12. Paul said, I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. No longer as a slave, more than a slave. A beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. As I mentioned, Paul was probably in his 60s. He called himself the aged Onesimus. While, they were, while he was in Rome with Paul, after he had become converted, had become very helpful to Paul in the ministry of the gospel. And so Paul says, I would like to have kept Onesimus to be with me. But Paul says the relationship between Philemon and Onesimus needed repairing. And Paul said that was more important. Yes, I need him here in Rome with me to help, but it's way more important for these two brothers in Christ, Philemon and Onesimus, to be reconciled. And that's why Paul says, for perhaps he departed a while for this purpose. It's not always possible to know if certain events were orchestrated by God or not. Paul could raise people from the dead, yet he didn't know himself whether God was behind this or not. And so that's why he says, perhaps this happened for that reason. So Philemon now was not just a slave, but now he was a brother. And he wanted, God wanted, Paul wanted Philemon to accept him as that. And then the last point begins in verse 17. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he's wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. He calls upon Philemon to receive Onesimus. The word receive there means to take as one partner. Accept him back. So here Paul asks Philemon to accept Onesimus. Why? Because now Onesimus had a relationship with he was a child of God. He was a son of God. So he had the same relationship now that Philemon had. Spiritual fellowship is far more important than positions in the world. Even though Philemon was, was taking Onesimus back, 
Onesimus had been a slave, th those positions weren't as important now as the fact that both of them were brothers in Christ. That was the most important relationship. Paul is asking Philemon to forgive Onesimus. Forgive him for running away. Forgive him for being gone for who knows how long, and we don't know how long he was gone. That cost Philemon a lot. Because now Philemon had to find someone else to do Onesimus' work and pay for it. And so that's why Paul says here that receive him back, and if he wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. See, restitution is part of repentance. Restitution is part of repentance. It's not the only place in the Bible that mentions this, but it is a part of repentance. And so there were two things. Philemon needed to graciously accept Onesimus back, but Onesimus, apparently through Paul, still had to make restitution. And so Paul here pleads with Philemon to take him back. Philemon, no doubt, was angry. He was hurt. He was disappointed that Onesimus had ran away. So even good men need encouragement to let go of their resentments and forgive someone. Even good men need that kind of encouragement. Like I said, Philemon probably was filled with resentment. He was angry, disappointed, discouraged. And so that's why Paul is encouraging him to forgive Onesimus. Reconciliation is important. And Paul said, if you two are reconciled, he says, it's going to refresh my heart in the Lord. I will have joy from you in the Lord. And when brothers or sisters in Christ are reconciled, that's what it should do. It should cause us joy. We should rejoice. It should refresh our heart. When we see two people reconciled that have been apart. And then Paul finishes the letter. He says, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Now he mentions these people. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you. As do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Mean. See, Paul had confidence in Philemon that not only would he do what he asked, but that Philemon would go the extra mile. See, Paul believed very strongly in prayer. He says, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted. This short letter is just filled with incredible lessons. couple of things in closing. We owe great debts to people who've had an impact on our lives. And when you think back, especially when you're get to some of our ages, there's been a lot of people that's had a good impact on your life. And you need to thank them if they're still with us or thank God for them for what they've done. And then the last thought, and I think it's an important one, is how would we treat others differently if we treated them like Christ has treated us? I think that's a great question. How would we treat others differently if we treated them like Christ has treated us? A wonderful way to think. In this letter, 25 verses, Paul just teaches Philemon, us a lot of very, very important lessons. Regardless of how worthless a person is, they can change. They can change. Someone's truly converted to Christ, they're no longer going to be a worthless do-nothing person. 
they're going to be a very valuable, very useful person. When they come to Christ, when they repent and are baptized, radical transformations take place. So this morning when Doug leads us in this invitation song, if there's a need in your heart to come forward, then we ask you to do that as we stand and sing.